as far as comic books are concerned, the reason that we're seeing a resurgence in popularity is because we're coming out of the dark ages. This is Chicho. Welcome to my channel. Now, what I want to do in this video is uh, sort of do a one-off video and uh, reply to an email that came my way a few days ago, actually, uh, last five days or so. And um, the, the email was interesting. It was, it was fun. And the questions were interesting, sort of asking me to share my opinion on a couple of topics of um regarding comic books right and comic books um since in my opinion comic books are sort of a reflection of our society as a whole so as soon as i read this email and the two questions were asked it sort of got the juices flowing and you know you could go down so many different <laughs> roads down this thing right so many that down so many rabbit holes regarding this right uh, but i'm gonna share my take after thinking about this for about three or four days okay uh, so let me read you the email okay and uh, what we're gonna do is uh, there's two questions being asked um, or two choices being given for me to comment on and I'm picking only one of them um, so let's have a read through this and uh, uh, we'll, we'll see where this takes us I've taken some notes and stuff like this okay um, and we're going to call the person Jay because I don't know if it's okay to use people's first names. They never know this or last names and stuff like this. Uh, so we're going to call the person Jay. So uh, this is Jay's email to me. Okay. Hi, Chicho. I watch your YouTube channel for a couple of years now, regularly watching your comic book content. I'm a student studying at St. John Moore's University in England. And I am currently in the process of creating a comic book based magazine looking at different areas of comic book culture, including previews, reviews, and various stories about modern day issues, etc. I'm contacting you to see if you would, you would like to partake in one of my stories. You have the choice of two subjects I will be writing about. Firstly, I am asking the question, are comic books too Americanized and patriotic. And I would love to get your perspective on this. The second story is about Netflix TV shows and blockbuster movies and how they are launching comic books back into the limelight and making them popular again. I would very greatly appreciate it if you would get back to me, get back to me, please. And if you are interested, Maybe you could uh, make a YouTube video out of it. If so, that would be totally awesome. Thank you very much for your time. Kind regards, Jay. And, um, you know, when I read this email, I replied uh, to Jay almost right away, I think. I, I usually try to reply right away if I don't. If you send me emails and haven't replied, my apologies. Um, if I don't get to an email, it might just you know, filter its way down and I might lose it, okay? Um, but I replied uh, to Jay and we talked a little bit and stuff like this and I was actually out of town so I just got it back into town like just barely last night, um, uh, today basically and I t they have a deadline on Monday. So uh, I've done a little bit of research on this, looked up just a handful of things because I basically got into town today and I'm making this video and I got to edit it and upload it within this day right uh, so please um, whatever I say uh, whatever I reply uh, you know I will try to provide references in the description of this video uh, but please check into it yourself because I haven't gone through multiple filtering uh, uh, cycles that I usually or I try to go through when I make videos and I write articles and stuff like this okay so there's two questions being asked the first one is, uh, da, 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 da. Uh, are comic books too Americanized and patriotic? So that's one of the first question, the first choice. And if you've been following my comic book videos, you'll know I've talked a little bit about this. I've thrown some hints and stuff like this. And um, I would definitely like to delve deep into this, but I think... Uh, um, 
uh, it's not something that I want to go into right now. And I would, I know there's a, a lot of references that I would like to pull out, uh, and there's a time restraint. So I may address this later sometime for the comic book videos. But what I want to do is address the second one. Um, the second question being this. The second story is about Netflix TV shows and blockbuster movies and how they are launching comic books back into the limelight and making them popular again. Okay. So that's what I like to address right now. And um, I've been watching, you know, when comic book uh, programs are coming on, series are coming on, I'm watching, you know, starting to watch all of them. There's a lot that I've stopped watching, but the Netflix series, definitely, um, I'm watching all of them. Daredevil was amazing. Daredevil 2 was amazing. Punisher was absolutely brilliant. Uh, <laughs> um, the appearance of Punisher and how they portrayed him and everyone was just totally psyched about the Punisher series coming out for sure, right? Jessica Jones was fantastic. Luke Cage was pretty good i like that i love the music about music about it and i can see uh what they were trying to do with the series so hugely appreciated for the angle that they took it in and um iron fist um it was good to start off fantastic start off with a bang and uh, uh i think they were experimenting and whatnot uh as far as i'm concerned it was the lesser of the four series um one of the reasons being is uh, um there was too many cuts during the fight scenes and stuff like this and there's uh, discrepancies uh it wasn't as uh, as filtered through as daredevil as edited you know taken out stuff that didn't make sense that shouldn't have been there uh, you saw that in luke cage a little bit as well right but loved all of them will continue watching all of them okay um that's my two cents as for the question um regarding you know where the question is leading uh for sure tv programs uh the tv shows have brought on comic books to a level where they're accessible uh, to a lot of mainstream uh, audiences okay um but i you know and they've had a lot to do with um you know comic books uh, sales start to pick up in the last few years especially the movies when they start coming out with Iron Man and whatnot right I think they were still filtered I think the series are uh, brilliant they portray the comic books uh, the monthlies much better than the movies do 100% right um, but if we've been seeing you know because of media TV shows movies and stuff like this we've been seeing sales of comic books pick up pick up pick up pick up uh, for the last you know it's been a on a serious nice growth rate i guess you want to call it for the last few years right so they've had a lot to do with it um but i don't think they're the main cause i don't think they're the main cause of comic books uh becoming popular um, they have a large part to play in it but i'm sort of going to address something regarding uh, my opinion as to why comic books sales are picking up and a lot of people are coming back into comic books and I've been watching my uh, comic book videos you'll know I've, I've talked about this a fair bit uh, and again throwing little hints here and there and whatnot um, but for me I think uh, the reason I believe that comic book sales have kicked up huge and it's not you know I'm not necessarily talking about the the boosts, the uh, the bump, I guess, uh, the movie bumps and the TV show bumps that that the industry is seeing with the pickup of people reading comic books. But because I don't think those the bumps stay up on that level. For sure, they introduce a certain number of people and drop off, and there's a whole bunch of people still, you know, coming on the industry and reading them, right? Uh, reading the comic books and stuff, especially picking up trays. Trays are picking it up big time, right? Um, but I think what's sustaining it, what's giving it the permanent growth that we're seeing right now, where people are picking up comic books, reading them, and going, wow, right? As long as they can find their way around the comic book store, right? It's very daunting, very difficult for someone um, without any knowledge to walk into a comic book store and go to the racks, the new release racks, and pick up a comic book and read it. That's almost 
you know, you'll be lucky if you pick up something that you're going to start reading. You're going to go, wow, that was fantastic. And you're going to come back and continuously read that, right? A lot of people are doing trades. Bookstores are picking, doing trades now and stuff like this, right? But I think what's, uh, what's sustaining people uh, jumping on and not leaving, right? Um, and bringing the collectors and whatnot, right? I think the main reason for that is is because of the demise of the uh, censorship that was hop- happening in the, street, in the industry through the comic code, okay? Now, for those of you uh, uh, who, I'm just gonna give you a little quick little rundown of what the comics code is. It's basically, uh, something that was introduced that came into effect in the the golden age of comics towards the end of the golden age of comics in early 1950s where uh, a book was written by a psychologist or psychiatrist or whoever it was right i forget his name and uh, i've looked it up multiple times um, i guess his name i got it here but it's frederick wellheim and the book was called seduction of the innocence okay and he put out that books uh that book saying that comic books were polluting children's minds, right? And basically what ended up happening was, you know, there was hearings through the government and the government was threatening to step in and the industry itself, what they did was they set up a little committee uh, and a very little committee um, of like-minded people that were, that was basically an echo chamber, right? Uh, That started censoring comic books for certain things. And what basically that happened, uh, what the end result of that was, um, was a lot of discourse, what a, a lot of conversation, a lot of creative outlet for artists and stuff like this was destroyed, was taken away. There were companies that went bankrupt because of this, right? And the comic codes, I'm gonna delve a little bit into this, okay? I'm gonna give you the reason why I think this is the case, um, that the main reason that we're seeing, you know, basically comic book industries being pulled out of is, 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 is death, really, because it, it had gone down to a level where, you know, there was a huge bump in the 90s where there was a huge bubble occurring and the mainstream media got involved and they hyped it up to a level where the whole thing completely collapsed and slowly it was trickling down to becoming an extremely, extremely niche little market where it would basically disappear within a within a decade or two, right? But now it's getting a boost where people see the future in comic books. It might not be exactly in the form that it's in right now, but it's going to be uh, brilliant, whatever it is. And it, this form will still be around uh, 50 years from now. I know there's a lot of talk about, you know, Comic book collecting is staying, is it going, stuff like that. Comic book collecting is not going to going to go away. It's just not, okay? It is a medium, uh, it, it is a form of art. And as far as I know, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but as far as I know, there is no form of art that has ever disappeared, right? I can't think of any. Records, people used to say this about records, right? Records will disappear. Companies that are printing records uh, are popping up all over the place and they're printing records for collectors, for aficionados, for for music lovers, because records provide you a certain sound that you cannot get off an MP3 or a WAV file, right? Just like live, live concerts provide you sound that you cannot get through anything else, right? Comic books, provide you a certain form of art form, a certain form of information, a certain form of uh, community, of sharing, of perspective that you cannot get in any other form, okay? So they're not going to, going to go away, but the, the reason that we're seeing the boost, right? So I'm going off on a lot of tangents right now, right? But let me read you the question again. And the question is this. The second story is about Netflix TV shows and blockbuster movies 
and how they are launch, launching comic books back into the limelight and making them popular again. Okay. So, for sure, the movies, the TV shows have a pretty large role to play in bringing people, introducing people to comic books. But in my opinion, uh, it's the demise of the comic code authority demise of censorship which is really giving comic books a boost a new life because we're at a time right now we're in the renaissance of comics we're in the second golden age of comics and uh, as far as the comic code goes it came into effect in 1954 and it lasted for decades to a level where uh, in the early 2000s uh, so in 2001 Marvel Comics decided not to follow the comic code, right? Not to submit to censorship, right? They still had their internal censorships for sure, right? Because of a large company, but they did not submit to a secondary set of filters coming in where they couldn't share a certain amount of information. And in, um, you know, in 2010, Bungo Comics, um, decided not to follow the comic code and it was only in 2011 where dc comics pulled out right which is absolutely insane so we're in 2017 right now and the comic code came into effect in 1954 and it was just in 2011 that dc comics decided not to submit to a secondary censorship filter and it was 2001 for Marvel Comics. So that's, you know, 1954, 1956, 57, 58, 59. Uh, sorry, um, 1954, 1964, 74, 84, 94, 2004. 50 years, right? 50 plus years for DC Comics and almost 50 years for Marvel Comics. They submitted to censorship. And if you want to know how hardcore the censorship was, and that was one of the main reasons. I mean, we had booths where they were selling comic books, you know. We could go really deep into this, and we might analyze this later looking at numbers. But there was different reasons for different, uh, you know, different times where comic books were giving, getting huge boosts, right? But with the age of technology, right, with the age of the internet, uh, if the comic book was still in effect, we would have seen the complete collapse of comic books, right? And for those of you who want to have an idea of how hardcore uh, the censorship was, right? Uh, you know, I'll, I'll provide links. This is the comics code thing. You can go to... <laughs> I put this thing up. There's a few pages. Uh, the comic code... Uh, Code of the Comics Magazine Association of America, Inc. Adopted October 26, 1954, right? So these are some of the things that were prohibited, censored, right? There's a whole list of the stuff, but uh, no comic magazine should use, use the words horror or terror in its titles. Scenes dealing with or <laughs> instruments associated with Walking Dead torture, vampires and vampirism, ghouls, cannibalism, and wolfism are prohibited, right? Crime shall never be presented in such a way as to create sympathy for the criminal, to promote distrust of the forces of law and justice, or to inspire others, right? Uh, others with a desire to imitate criminals. Ah. Uh, scenes of excessive violence and nudity nudity in any form is prohibited as is incident or undue exposure uh, there's stuff about marriage here where you can't depict marriage and in insanity insanity right and again if you've seen uh, some of my videos some of the readings and stuff like this uh, i you know, the last video we did, uh, one of the last videos we did, I think second last one, about comic books where I showed you um, 
my savage sort of uh, Conan magazines, right? We were looking at the covers, and at the same time, we talked about uh, Conan the Barbarian, which was in comic book format, so it had to abide by the comic code. And we talked about Savage Sword of Conan, taking a look at the covers. And because it was in magazine format, large format, it didn't have to abide by the comic code. And while we're looking at the covers of Savage Sword of Conan, I was reading you a couple of essays by Roy Thomas, the person that was instrumental in bringing Savage Sword of Conan, the rights to Savage Sword of Conan, to Marvel Comics so they could publish them, right? And Conan the Barbarian in comic book format is brilliant, of course, right? Fantastic with Barry Windsor Smith art. But when you read that and then you read Savage Sword of Conan, it's got a different feel because the Savage Sword of Conan is more true. It's not censored as much anyway. The only censors are really through Marvel Comics. It's not through a secondary sensor that follows such insane <laughs> things as criminals shall not not be presented so as to be rendered glamorous or to occupy a position which creates a desire for emulation right that was part of the comic code and what we did when we we're looking at that that video we looked at the savage sword of conan and we read roy thomas's first essay about how marvel comics was able to acquire the rights to conan right to print the comic books and the second essay which was extremely crucial was how roy thomas and barry windsor smith were maneuvering themselves around the censorship that the comic book code was forcing on them right they were self-censoring and trying to slip in every little thing now and then right and while we were reading that we found out that they couldn't show nudity right they couldn't show blood <laughs> we're talking savage sword of conan right barbarian sword and sorcery and one of the things which i found incredible which cracked me up which i really intended to uh, that's one of the things i really tried to do <laughs> with with that video showing you the covers of savage sword of conan uh, one of the things that you couldn't do according to the comic code and I don't know if they show this in any comic book maybe they were able to slip some through the comic book through the censors over the five decades 50 years or so right but you were not allowed to show decapitation right we're talking sword and sorcery one of the ways you can kill certain types of creatures of the night is to is to decapitate them right so you couldn't show decapitation and on the covers of savage sort of conan we had at least two covers where conan is holding up heads of his foes right and and that was incredible to me right and you have to keep in mind that the industry the comic book industry is is one of the most amazing mediums artistically politically economically it's just one of the most amazing genres to be in and to explore and to read its history if you want to get, get an idea of what was happening through society right as far as i know from everyone that i've talked to i don't know one person i've never come across anyone that has been a comic book aficionado comic book owner an artist a creator a writer that agreed with the censorship with the comics code so for 50 plus years this comics goes this outside body that controlled the flow of information right got to dictate what people were exposed to and any publisher that didn't abide by the comic code was extremely underground they had minimal distribution because a lot of big industries a lot of big corporations would not carry the comic books right in their stores so they couldn't sell them right so these gatekeepers which were the censors were only one such gatekeepers from the comics the people creating the comics the people the artists sharing their stories to the people consuming the comic books there were multiple filters put in place the censorship the comic code was one the 
distributors were another, right? And there used to be a lot more distributors. Now we're down to sort of a monopoly with Diamond Comics that there was the distributors wars happening in the early 1990s. And, you know, there was about, you know, two main distributors, but there was like maybe, you know, 10, 10 to 15 secondary distributors. But when the distributor wars happened, they all folded and we're basically down to one distributor, Diamond Comics. And there is a couple of, there's another couple other people dabbing their toes into the field, right? Hopefully we'll get a little bit of competition. So there won't be only one gatekeeper as far as distributors concerned, right? Maybe the other distributors will not act as such huge gatekeepers as Diamond does, right? So we had, you know, for a number of years, we've had the comic book censorship, right? We've had the distributors acting as the gatekeepers. We've had some publishers censoring their own material and understandable, you know, uh, the publisher has 100% right to uh, dictate what their product is, right? You know, some people are more adult-oriented, some people are more kid-oriented, right? Uh, more G-rated oriented. And those are amazing comic books as well, right? I've loved many of them. Some of the greatest comic books ever written were geared towards uh, G-rated, right? And some of the greatest comic books ever written were R-rated, right? And you know, the other types of gatekeepers were the comic book store owners themselves, right? One of the, one of the books that we read uh, during the comic book reading sessions was um, Lobo Number no. 1, the first African-American uh, comic book series with this monthly title that came out. And unfortunately, it only lasted two issues because of censorship, right? Because comic book stores and this was a comic uh, we talk about a little bit about this when we're doing the reading because Del, you know Dell Comics released this comic uh, comic book about a it was a western about a uh, black african-american cowboy that you know just gets he's at the wrong place at the wrong time and becomes a fugitive and becomes a hero and stuff like this and you know there's a lot of imagery in that comic that comic is absolutely brilliant the one of the panels that we read um you know i printed it off I've, it's been buried but it's this one here right uh this one right here where you know you see cowboys on top of a bull that they've you know uh, from their i guess i don't know i don't know if you call it a herd or not but uh, the cattle that they have and uh the comment that's being said said is easy there fella we're all branded one way or another right and the image in the background is black and there's a lot of silhouettes in this comic and it's a brilliant comic book right but what happened when this comic came out a lot of stores decided not to carry it right and this was in the 1960s right they didn't like the idea of a black hero in comic book so what they did they packaged it all up sent it to dell comics dell comics printed the second issue and the same thing happened and no publisher can have all you know majority of the books coming out being sent back to them right i read somewhere that only fifteen thousand copies of this ever made it onto the stands right or were printed or were accessible to people right so you know that was another form of gatekeepers so to answer the question let me read this question again because i am going off on tangents but it's it's pretty important to appreciate how powerful censorship is and what the end result is um, what comes about when censorship is removed from society where we're able to express ourselves freely right is is we get a renaissance we get we get a we get something incredible happening right so the question that i'm sort of trying to answer right now in a long-winded kind of way is are the netflix shows and blockbuster movies um, is regarding how the Netflix shows and blockbuster movies are relaunching comic books into the limelight and making them popular again. And again, my reply would be, 
they have a part to play in it. But I think the major part that the major reason for this is, because I don't think that's the cause and effect. It's just the resurgence of comic books, the love of comic books, of collecting, the increase in the number of uh, comics being sold, the print runs and stuff like this. I don't think it's directly related or only related to the movies. I think in large part, in much larger part, is related to gatekeepers being eliminated from, you know, censorship being removed from creators, from artists producing their work to people, aficionados, me and you reading their works, right? There are less people that have a say in what's published, right? And I think that's what we're seeing right now. And this isn't only in the comic book realm, right? Like just let me give you one more example, but the absurdity of the censorship, and you must appreciate how absurd this was, right? The absurdity of the censorship went to the level where certain words could not be used. One of them was wolf, wolfmen, right? Werewolves and stuff like this. And there's a story here about DC Comics uh, where they ran into uh, uh, trouble with the comic code. And I'm just going to read you this little write-up. Uh, and this is on Wiki as well. And I'm just going to read you this little write-up just to give you an idea how absurd the censorship was and how complete it was, right? And anything with that type of censorship is, is doomed to fail, doomed to fail, right? But as soon as those barriers are removed, you will see people light up again, right? You will see a resurgence, and that's, I think, what we're seeing happen, right? So this is how absurd the level of censorship was. Uh, writer Marv, Wol Marv Wolfman, Wolfman's name, was briefly a point of contention between DC Comics and the CCA, the Comics Code Authority, right, CCA. In the super, Supernatural Mystery Anthology, House of Secrets 83, January 1970, right? So this is 1970. The book's host introduces the story of the stuff that dreams are made of as one told to him by a wandering wolfman, right? So this is a certain way create the, the publishers try to maneuver themselves around the censorship, right? So January 1970, the book's host introduced the story, the stuff that dreams are made of, as one told to him by a wandering wolfman. All capitals, comics, lettering, made no distinction between wolfman and wolfman. Capital letter with W, right? The CCA rejected the story and flagged the wolfman reference as a violation, right? Fellow writer Gary Conway explained to the CCA, to the Comics Code Authority, that the story's author was in fact named Wolfman. That's his last name, right? Marv Wolfman, one of, the great, one of the greatest creators in comic books. And asked whether it would still be in violation if they were clearly stated, right? The CCA agreed that it would not be as long as Wolfman the last name, received the lighter writer's credit on the first page of the story. This led to DC beginning to credit creators in its supernatural mystery anthologies. So the censorship was so absolute that DC Comics had to explain that the writer's name was Wolfman, right? Wow, wow, wow. That's how absolute censorship can be. That's how, you know, the saying goes, power only wants power, or absolute power corrupts, right? Uh, and this is, this is, you know, just taking a little tangent, but this is one of the reasons, uh, you know, if one of the authors that I've read a lot of essays of, and, one of the authors that I've watched a lot of lectures, one of philosophers, one of the greatest philosophers as far as I'm concerned of the 20th century, right, was uh, Robert Anton Wilson, right? And 
censorship. Uh, and this, this type of censorship is not, has not only been prevalent in comic books, it's prevalent within our society right now, right? Gatekeepers try to maintain their power, always, right? Always, or increase it. They seldom ever give up power, right? Unless they're forced to give up power, which is one of the reasons where in the, you know, in the age of technology right now, technology has a lot to do with comic books getting a resurgence as well in, in popularity, right? From fan-made uh, fan shorts to people creating their own comics, sharing web comics, and talking about comics the way I'm doing right now and sharing their love of comics, right? That has a lot to do with it as well, right? But one of the reasons that censorship is is so so destructive and so powerful to those who are the gatekeepers right and one of the places we're seeing this right going off on tangible one of the places we're seeing this is through the internet where we're seeing right now a lot of governments corporations uh passing laws or lobbying governments or bribing governments to pass laws to give them power to censor the internet because they are losing power, right? They, you know, just on every level, right? Censorship has been prevalent within our society, right? Comic books was just one of the first places where in this modern age of technology, civilization, right? We've seen censorship. It's been, you know, we've seen it hit through music. We've seen it hit through movies, of course, right? TV programs. We've seen it, um, appearing in art in in every aspect of our lives there's been huge huge uh, discussion and debate on censorship right and I'd like to read you a sort of a comment that Robert Anton Wilson made regarding censorship and that's my take on this as well okay that right now we're in the in Renaissance period, we're seeing another golden age. We're seeing a resurgence of art, of free speech, of a freedom of expression popping up where certain powers are trying to make sure that that doesn't become the norm, right? They're trying to prevent that. For us comic book lovers, creators, uh, aficionados, for 50 years, we were under the boot, as I guess Orwell put it, right, of authority, of censorship. We're just coming out of that. So what we're seeing right now, one of the main, as far as I'm concerned, the main reason that we're seeing a resurgence in the love of comics and appreciation of comics in and on the investment aspect of it, the price is kicking up huge in comic books right is because the demise of censorship right and robert anton wilson had something to say about this not just about comic books but about our society in general and his comments was this and he was specifically talking about expansion of consciousness right imagination and I'm going to read you, I'm not going to read you the whole paragraph because it might not resonate, um, might not make sense, but it's a piece taken from Timothy Leary's Eight Circuits of Consciousness uh, from Robert Anton Wilson's Cosmic Trigger, um, Final Secret of the Illuminati, right? So this is a piece from Robert Anton Wilson's uh, Cosmic Trigger, final secrets of the Illum Illuminati, right? And it's he's making comments regarding Timothy Leary's Eighth Circuit of Consciousness. And uh, Robert Anton Wilson came up with a, his own, I guess, exercises, his own uh, perspective on, on that as well. And a lot of other people have, will have um, as well, right? So this is just one perspective. But uh, this little quote regards to censorship. And to answer the question again, let me read you the question those that I'm trying to provide my perspective on, long-winded perspective on. Uh, must be read. And I think at some point, maybe 
I'll make a little video of reading you all of <laughs> the comic code of uh, 1954. Okay, so let me read you this, the question that was sent my way. The second story is about Netflix's TV shows and blockbuster movies and how they are launching comic, comic books back into the limelight and making them popular again. My reply, right, uh, my take is that just like Deadpool is, you know, has basically become the largest grossing R-rated movie, just like the Punisher TV program is gonna be R-rated or whatever the rating is that Netflix uses, right? Just like Wolverine, the last old man Logan, was R-rated and they're extremely popular, uh, and they will continue to be, and we will continue to see more mature stories coming onto the scene. May they be comic books, may they be books like The Walking Dead, not abiding by the comic code. I mean, I wonder if the creators of The Walking Dead, one of the reasons they picked the title of The Walking Dead was because the Comic Code Authority had banned The Walking Dead, right? Or Walking Dead, right? Uh, so my take is, the main reason that we're seeing a resurgence in comic book is because of the demise of censorship within the comic book medium, right? And artists and creators are able to share things that were prohibited before in this medium, in this medium that basically activates our left and right brain at the same time when we're looking at images and reading text, right? Very few mediums will do that, if any, right? So we're seeing the main cause is because of the demise of censorship and robert anton wilson had something to say about this right and uh maybe at some point we'll read the comic book codes but here's what robert anton wilson said in cosmic trigger final secret of the illuminati and let's read the whole paragraph the suppression of scientific research in this area has had the unfortunate result of turning the outlaw drug culture back towards Fifth Circuit hedonics and pre-scientific tunnel realities, the occult rival, socialism, pop orientalism. Without scientific discipline and mythology, methodology, few can successfully decode the often frightening but philosophically crucial six circuit metaprogramming signals and this is the relevant quote such scientists as do continue to study the subject dare not publish the results which are illegal and record 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 ever wider tunnel realities only in private conversations like the scholars of the inquisition era voltaire announced the age of reason two centuries too soon. We are still in the dark ages. As far as comic books are concerned, the reason that we're seeing a resurgence in popularity is because we're coming out of the dark ages. Okay. That's it for now. I'll see you guys in the next video.